Un aplauso muy fuerte para Miko Hiponen. So my name is Mikko, and I hunt hackers. That's my job. And when I say hackers, I don't mean you guys. I mean, I, I mean the evil hackers. I mean the people who write the viruses, who create the Trojans, who spread the malware, who send the spam, the evil people who try to hurt us online. And I believe that we have now reached a stage where it's more likely for any of us to become a victim of a crime in the online world instead of the real world. Now think about that. Historically, if you've ever become a victim of a crime, it's been some, someone stealing your wallet or breaking into your house or stealing your car. And what's common with those criminals, real world criminals, is that they are close to you. They live in the same city as you do. Criminals from, I don't know, Sydney, Australia are not flying over to Madrid to steal your cars. If your car gets stolen, it's someone local. But we are the first generation in mankind's history that are living our lives both in the real world and in the online world. And the more we are in the online world, the more we are exposed to criminals who can be anywhere on the planet. Anywhere on the planet. So even if you live in a safe country, on a safe continent, in a safe city, when you leave the real world and you go to the online world, now you have to worry about criminals who can be anywhere. And I've spent my life trying to understand online criminals, online attackers, evil hackers, what drives them? Why are they doing what they are doing? And what can we do about it? And I started this in the early 1990s. In fact, I carry something to remind myself of where I'm coming from. Some of you might recognize this. Some of you will not recognize this. This is the USB thumb drive of the 1990s. This one is a single-sided, single-density floppy which carries 360 kilos of data. Not gigas, not megas, kilos. And this is the way malware used to spread. When I started analyzing malware in 1991, this was what we were working with. And today it looks like a joke that something spreading on a physical disk could actually become a real problem, but they did become real problems. This particular floppy is infected by the form.a virus from 1992, which did go around the world, in fact computers in over 200 different countries. And it was carried from in every country to another country. It didn't spread over any networks because we didn't have networks. But today, the kind of attacks that we are fighting are completely different from these early viruses like form.a. Because in the early days, malware and viruses were being written by teenage kids. Teenage kids in their basement writing viruses for fun. That's what the problem used to be. And that's not the problem anymore. We're not seeing malware attacks coming from teenage boys in their basements. That's, that's a tiny part of the problem. Today, most of the malware, most of the criminal attacks, most of the hacking cases, most of the data breaches are coming from organized crime. Organized crime groups running botnets, creating malware and stealing our money. It's not the only group, but it is the biggest. Yes, we do have groups like hacktivists, like the Anonymous Movement, which has been at some times more active and other times a little bit more passive. But movements like the Anonymous do break the law. They do hack into places. They do defacement, but they don't do it 
to make money. Their motive is not to steal. Their motive is to protest. Or their motive is a political motive. And that makes them different from money-making criminals. But I suppose the biggest surprise to me over the years that I've been hunting hackers is that governments have become such a big part of this. If someone would have told me in the beginning of my career that eventually Marlborough will be written by intelligence agencies and by militaries and even law enforcement units will be developing and deploying Marlborough against their own citizens. If someone would have told me that in 1991, I would not have believed it. But that's exactly where we are today. That's exactly where we are today. Yesterday, U.S. federal government indicted 12 Russian hackers for meddling into the U.S. presidential elections in 2016, in which Donald Trump was elected as the president of the United States. And every single one of those Russian hackers worked for a Russian intelligence agency. They worked for the government. This is the world where we live right now. Intelligence agencies and militaries are heavily involved in developing and deploying malware. Why are militaries interested? They're interested because cyber weapons are effective, affordable, and deniable. Affordable, effective, and deniable. That's a pretty good combination in a weapon. It's a cheap weapon, but it gets the job done, and you can deny that it wasn't yours. There's very few weapons like this. Like if you send a B-52 bomber to drop bombs, it's kind of hard to deny that you did it, because it's right there, and you can see the flag on the side of the plane. But when you do a cyber attack, you can keep denying it as long as you want. It's very hard to prove attacks and trace them back to where they're coming from. That's why the indictment yesterday is extraordinary. We rarely see investigations that are able to find the individuals behind governmental attacks. Most of the time when we find hackers, they're criminals who were caught because they weren't hiding the money or we could follow somehow their movements, or they made errors or mistakes. Stupid stuff. But most, in most cases, governments are never caught. Most likely, the most famous governmental malware case was Stuxnet from 2010. And we all know who created Stuxnet. It was the government of the United States together with the Israelis. We all know this. But they still keep denying it. And there's no way to prove it. This is why governments are interested in cyber weapons. So we spent the last 60 years in arms race, the nuclear arms race. We're now sort of, I think we, we think we are out of the nuclear arms race by now. Cold War is over. But to me, it feels like that as soon as we got out of the last arms race, we jumped headlong into the next arms race, the cyber arms race. And the cyber arms race might very well be in its beginning. It might very well be that, you know, it's going to stay with us for the next 60 years. Who knows? But in most of the cases, when you hear strong words about, like, cyber war or things like that, it's not really real cyber war. Most of the incidents which are labeled as cyber war in newspapers have nothing to do with cyber war. Because most cases where governments use online attacks are about spying or it's about intelligence gathering. And spying isn't war, spying is spying. And if something isn't war, we shouldn't be calling it a war. But 
there are cases which are happening which are hard to define as anything else except cyber war. Let me give you an example. Last year, in 2017, we saw two massively large malware outbreaks. In May, we saw WannaCry, where the initial biggest infections were right here in Madrid, and then it went worldwide. And then, in the end of June, we saw Petya. WannaCry got the biggest headlines, but Petya was the most important case. Petya, which I believe was the single most expensive computer security incident in history. Most expensive computer security incident in history. More expensive than WannaCry or I Love You or Melissa or Blaster or Slammer or any malware case or any outbreak ever. More expensive than any hack ever. More expensive than any data leak ever. And the companies which got infected by Petya did not get infected because they were running old operating systems or unpatched devices or were uh, having users in their networks clicking on phony links or opening booby trap attachments. No. The reason why they, these organizations were hit was that they were running a financial software, a bookkeeping software, a piece of software which could be used to do bookkeeping and to file your taxes. Because on the 29th of June last year, the servers, the update servers of this financial bookkeeping software issued an automatic update, and that update was Petya. So if you were running this particular software in your network, you got infected automatically. The update was coming from the right server. It was signed. It was legit. And that's how you got infected. And the software in question is called MEDOC. And the software in question is developed in Kyiv, in Ukraine. Coming. Um, Advance to the next slide manually. I think the clicker isn't. Here we go. Hold on. Yeah, now it works. Thank you. So this is the software. And in May, five different intelligence agencies all announced that they have evidence which proves that Petya was developed and deployed by Russian government, and that the target was Ukraine. This is Ukrainian software. It's only used by Ukrainian companies. It is the de facto bookkeeping software in the country of Ukraine. This is how companies file their taxes in Ukraine. You hit targets through this venue, and you hit one country. And Russia and Ukraine are at war. Russia has attacked Ukrainian networks before, multiple times during this crisis. And this is now hard to label as anything else except cyber war, because these countries are at war. And when one part of a war deploys cyber attacks against another country during wartime, well, it's hard to call it anything else. However, this is not the story we heard about Petya last June or July when it was going. The story we heard about Petya was more of a story about things like cargo ships getting stopped by infections and companies, Western companies all over the world fighting massively large infections in their networks. And these companies have nothing to do with Ukraine. Why were they hit? These are not Ukrainian companies. Why were they hit by Petya, which is, or was supposed to be, a Russian attack against one country? Well, even though these companies are not Ukrainian companies, they are global companies. They operate around the world. They all do business in most countries on the planet, including Ukraine. And if you do enough business in Ukraine, you have to file taxes in Ukraine. And if you have to file taxes in Ukraine, 
you do it with ME DOC, which means all these organizations had at least one workstation on their internal network running ME DOC. And if you had one machine in your internal network on the 29th of June last year, you got infected by Petya. So this was collateral damage. Collateral damage at a massive scale. And this is a good example on how the attacks are changing. Another big shift, big trend that we are witnessing has to do with money. Because money is changing. Money is changing into data. When you look at the attacks that we used to witness, say, two or three years ago, money making was mostly done by targeting online stores to steal credit card numbers or online banks with banking trojans to insert extra transactions or with keyloggers to gain access to PayPal passwords. That's how you made money. Well, now we're seeing the very same attackers, the very same gangs shifting their attacks to target, instead of banks, cryptocurrency exchanges, instead of online stores, online wallets, instead of phishing for PayPal passwords, phishing on Twitter to trick people into sending Ethereum into wrong addresses. And we're seeing remarkably advanced attacks. We've now seen two attacks where the BGP routing protocol was being spoofed in a massively large attack for the purpose of redirecting people to phishing pages. Now, BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, is a protocol which we've known for years can be spoofed, but it's very hard to do. And we've seen no real attacks against it. We've never seen attacks which tried to make money by targeting BGP. We've now seen two attacks targeting the BGP protocol, one against my Ether wallet and one against uh, Trezor. Trezor is a physical Bitcoin wallet. It's used by people who have large amounts of Bitcoin. Two weeks ago, when you went to the official website of Trezor, the real website, the real URL, some users were rerouted to a lookalike page phishing page, which was in the right address, which told these users that there's been a security breach and now you have to do a recovery seed operation to safeguard your Bitcoin. Why are we seeing this trend? Because this money, virtual money, cryptocurrencies, they are already anonymized and already untraceable. That's perfect for criminals. When they hit traditional systems, like credit cards, they can gain access to money, but then they have to launder it. Here they don't. And we had to worry about these things, these kind of attacks, for years and years on our computers. And the last trend I'll mention is the fact that these kinds of headaches are now following us into new platforms. Because computers are changing. It's not longer just about our laptops and smartphones and tablets. It's about everything becoming a computer. The IoT revolution will happen whether we like it or not. The IoT revolution will happen whether we like it or not. Whether we play part or not. It's going to happen anyway. And the attackers are paying attention. We've been tracking attacks against connected devices for a couple of years now. Here's our timeline. And if you start looking at what starts happening around 2015, we're seeing more and more botnets, which are not infecting computers at all. Instead, they're infecting heat pumps and security cameras and smart locks, IoT things, things that you can't secure the way we secure our traditional computing devices, which is by installing security software. I work for a security software company, and I will promise you, we will never make antivirus for a toaster. <laughs> All right? We will never make antivirus for a toaster. We have to find some other way of defending our connected devices, because they do need defending. 
And at the end of the day, we can take all the security problems we've seen over the last 25 years, 30 years, every single one of the breaches and hacks and malware outbreaks, and we can divide all of these into two different groups, technical problems and people problems. Technical problems or people problems. Technical problems might be really hard to fix, but at least we know how to fix them. In the end, they're just bugs. You fix the box, you update the system. But people problems are hard to fix. We have no patch for human brain. We have no patch for stupidity. And people do stupid stuff. People do stupid stuff. Stupid stuff like, I don't know, take pictures of their credit cards and post it on Twitter. And then, when somebody asks her that, hey, that's a nice card, what's the number on the other side? She answers. <laughs> My friends, there's no patch for that. Thank you very much.